All right. So welcome everyone to uh, this workshop brought to you by learn.wordpress.org. Um, this is titled WordPress as a Paintbrush, Internet Art Then and Now um, with Rachel Winchester. Um, and so quick introductions. Uh, my name is Courtney. Um, I am calling in today from the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Um, and I am a contributor um, to the WordPress Open Source Project uh, on mainly, mainly focusing on the uh, the training team. Uh, I've also contributed to the community teams um, and TV team. And um, today we have Rachel Winchester with us today. She's a product designer um, coming from uh, Philadelphia. And um, yeah, she's here to, to share her knowledge about internet art. And I'm really excited to have you here, Rachel. So I'll let you take, take over here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I gave this presentation once before last year at uh, WordCamp Montclair. 2022, but um, you know, in that format, it's it's very standard, and I feel like this is um, more intimate, and I can um, ask, I can answer your questions in real time, and uh, get your feedback, or, or have you guys get on the mic if you'd like. Um, so yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, my presentation is a web page, um, so after. After the, um, when the hour is over, I'll share the web page. Um, I'm not going to share it now because I don't want you guys to skip ahead before me. Mm -hmm. um, but also, my site is still generating. It's a static site and it's generating a, a new copy still. So I don't think this page is even published. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, thank you everyone for coming uh, to attend my talk WordPress as a paintbrush, internet, internet art then and now. My name is Rachel Winchester. A lot of people just call me Win for short, so uh, just keep it simple. And uh, as, as Courtney said, I am an independent product designer. Uh, my company is called Visual Web Webmaster LLC. All right. Um, so a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, and I guess a lot of the insights um, that I've had in putting together this presentation really come from my, my background and my perspective. Um, so uh, back in 2017, I graduated from college with a bachelor's in art history. So my background isn't actually in, in product design or software engineering or business or anything. It's, it's in art history. And I started working at contemporary art museums and galleries. I was a tour guide. I was in visitor services. I was in the education department. Um, but that's um, where things started for me in my career. Um, however, as a hobby, I managed a couple websites. They were arts related websites, of course, but they were built on WordPress. So around 2020, I decided to turn my hobby into my career. So I, I started a UX design bootcamp uh, and I've done quite a few contracts with, with different agencies and entrepreneurs of different sizes. Um, since then. Uh, so now I'm an independent product designer. Okay. So the, this presentation is going to be real, really simple, just starting one with the original net artist with a capital N and how they set the stage for all the, all the rest of the creativity that came um, with the internet afterwards. Uh, then I'll talk about WordPress and how that really revolutionized everything and brought us from then until now. And then I'll talk about some newer technologies that we have available to us now and what's coming in the future and how we can take inspiration from what the internet artists were doing in the past to move into the future. Okay. So first is net art, setting the stage. All right, so let's all go back to the 90s um, raise your hand or say in the chat if you remember the early 90s. Uh, night, let's see, what was happening in the 90s? There was Cartoon Network that just started, Oprah Interviews, Michael Jackson. Uh, I, I wasn't on the earth yet in the early 90s, so I had to look up some things uh, to kind of 
put together this collage and kind of get a, a, an image of the, the zeitgeist of the early 90s, what culture was like and technology was like, what politics are happening. Uh, and I'm starting in the early 90s because this is when people were really first starting to get online and when the internet was really starting to come to uh, the, the public. So um, just some important pieces of inter internet history. Let me move this, uh, okay. Uh, one question, is the um, Zoom bar at the bottom in the screen share? No, I don't see it. Okay, okay. There are a few overlays kind of in my way. All right, so back to the early 90s. The Apple Macintosh 2 was, uh, from my research, the, the first personal computer that kind of revolutionized uh, desktop publishing. Um, computers, there were computers before this one, but they were kind of larger and only used by companies, universities, the government. Um, but it, it was the Apple Macintosh 2 that was small enough and affordable enough for people to use in their homes and in their daily lives. Um, but the history of computers isn't exactly the same as the history of the internet. The first internet service provider, it was called World because it connected the world, that came on the scene in 1991. And by 1992, there were about a million people online. Um, a million is not, is not a large number at all. Um, I'm in Philadelphia right now, and uh, one million is much smaller than the amount of people in Philadelphia. Uh, so only a million people online. Um, it's 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 small if you consider the scale. And then by 1994, that's when HTML was first released to the public. So this is like the official first tool that the public had access to to make something for the internet. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, things kind of happened in phases, getting uh, people online and uh, using computers. So first it was the government started, the internet started as a government program. Then it spread to universities to get to be used for research. Then of course, corporations that had the resources and the, the, the money and time to um, space for those giant computers. And then uh, we as the public. So internet art started right when the public was getting online. Uh, it's right in the early nineties when, um, I mean, maybe there were some artists in the corporations and universities and government too, but generally we, when I talk about the artists, I mean artists in the general public. So these were the first people of the general public to start using computers and the internet in very creative ways. And they um, did things very consciously. So I'll give you this brief, uh, definition, but I think you'll understand the definition one more, more once I jump into those examples. Uh, so internet art is, it's conceptual. It's a lot more about the ideas relating to or based on the mental concepts. Um, so what the art is about and not necessarily like what it looks like or what it's made of. Um, internet art is also inherently digital. It's digital art because uh, the internet uses digital technologies to work. Servers, computers, those are all very digital technologies. Um, and then the main difference, the factor that makes it different than other conceptual arts and digital arts is that it is internet centric. So the art is about the internet, uh, which is again, a global, computer network for information and, and communication. Let me just get a drink real fast. Um, so I see some questions coming in the chat. I think I'll, I'll go over some questions after uh, my first three uh, demos, first three examples, uh, in case you guys have questions about those examples too. Um, so the first example I'll show you is Jody. Jody is an art duo uh, with Joan Heemskirk and Dirk Paismans. 
Uh, so the, the piece that they created in 1995 was called a, a work of code poetry. That's how they described it. And uh, this piece is not only an artwork, but it's their first website, their website for their art. Um, so I'll take you there in a new tab. All right, so the URL is www.jody.org. And when you are, when you go to this home screen, you see these neon characters filling up the screen. This is just a cover page. Um, it's actually just one large link. So I'll click through to the link and I'm brought to the index, kind of like a menu of sorts. Um, very cool looking, doesn't really make sense to me at all. Kind of looks like a mesh of things like I've maybe seen before, like a map. Um, uh, looks like something that people in the CIA might see on their screens, I'm not sure. Like the TV show 24 or something. Um, but it's it's been, it was called uh, code poetry and like visual poetry just because of the way that um, just the, the way the images, the, the, the graphics that they're making uh, kind of create this visual poetry. So it's, it's abstract art. Um, and each thing is a different link. So I'm actually gonna go back just one page so that you can see that there are different links on this page. So um, I can click on different things and I'll be brought to different screens. Um, but each screen is kind of um, nonsense. It's that abstract poetry, visual poetry, just colors, visuals, graphics. Um, I'm gonna keep clicking just cause I see that, you know, my cursor is turning into a, a, a hand. So an, an element is clickable. And, and that's how they, that's how they want you to go through this work to experience this artwork. Uh, you click on a link, it obviously doesn't make sense. So you can arbitrarily click on random things and just keep going through this digital world that they've created for you online. I think this looks really cool. I can see this design on like a graphic t-shirt or something. Um, do you guys like internet art? If you like internet art, you can let me know in the chat, maybe put in some of your favorite, sorry, not internet art, abstract art <laughs> or poetry if you're a fan of poetry. Okay. Um, so this quote, I think explains very well what you were just seeing. Uh, when you work with computers, you have sound and you have image, but in the computer, you also have had code. And we tried to play with that a lot. And that's Joan Heemskirk, which is one of the two men in, in Jody. Um, so they're really just trying to see what could happen, the images that they can come up with with the new form of code that is, again, just released to the public in 1994. Uh, so the next um, example that I'll go that I'll go through is uh, from Aaliyah Lea Lena from 1996. Uh, and this piece was described as net film. It's uh, essentially internet theater. Um, and Aaliyah Lealina, she's, I, I go back to her often in my research and really just trying to understand internet art because she was such a, a pioneer in, in um, the internet art scene. She was one of those people who was very consciously trying to form a definition of what internet art was. And she was very consciously like reaching out to people uh, with an email and with newsletters to um, get artists to communicate with, with each other, make art together and figure out the definition of internet art together. So she was a pioneer and an organizer and a curator, but also an artist, one of the originals. Um, so what I'll show you now is uh, the artwork, My Boyfriend Came Back From The War from 1996, open that in a new tab. Okay. And this, uh, this also has kind of a cover screen and it sets up the film or the theater, the internet theater that I explained before. My boyfriend came back from the war. After dinner, they left us alone. 
click on the link and it brings you to this very low res image that load, loads very slowly. Um, oh, and this element is clickable. So I'll click on it. And now I see two areas of content. There's on the left, the same screen from before, but just in the left side of the screen. And on the right, uh, a face that's loading very, very slowly. Everything's very low res. Um, and, and what she's actually set up, again, this is called a, a net, a, a net film, what did I say before? A net film, correct. Right. So what she's doing is she's setting the stage. She's um, creating these iframes within the browser window to partition uh, the stage. And the window is essentially the stage for the theater. Um, on the left side is one scene that's developing and on the right side is another scene that's developing. Um, and uh, I'm just going to keep clicking through just so we can keep seeing what happens. Some text appear. Well, the, the iframe was split in half again. So the stage keeps getting partitioned. And I could move them around if I want to. Um, looks like I, there's a couple links there I can click on. And I can click on here, too. So I mean, I guess the story will unfold depending on where I click. Um, so this film, this theater, the story depends on where you choose to click. It's it's a unique and customized experience for each audience member, um, but it also means that it's not necessarily the same experience every time each person goes through. Um, so I'm not going to go through each path because that might take too long, but um, I'll just read what's come on the screen so far. So where are you? I can't see you. So last time we met, last time we met when and you promised, look, salute in honor of you. Um, I think it's interesting how the images are, are loading slowly because some are, are instant and some load more slowly. Um, you don't trust me, I see. Will you marry me? So it's some kind of love story that's that's developing. And I guess from the from the first sentence, my boyfriend came back from the war. Um, we can tell that it's that kind of story. So it seems like a tragic love story. Um, I won't have time to go through all of it, um, but you guys can definitely go through this on your own. Again, each, each time will be different. Each experience will be different. Um, and I really like this piece because it was kind of a happy accident for her, for Olia Lialina. Um, this quote kind of very well, it really explains what she was doing. So I was not very fond of this format back then. I would have preferred it to be a video, but animated GIF was the only way to get a moving image in the browser. So she wasn't really trying to make some kind of net film. Well, she was trying to make net film, but what she had to her had available to her was HTML and iframes, and that's what developed. So it was uh, trying to do one art form using a different medium, hence internet art. Um, and this third example uh, by Mark America was from 1997. This was called an epic novel. He, he described it as an epic novel. And it is a very epic artwork. It's not only a very long novel with 400 pages, 400 web pages, uh, but it's an ongoing project. He's still working on this project today. Um, there's, been de de there's been different iterations uh, based on the new technology that emerged, that is available to him, the new things that come along with the internet. Um, so it's a never ending story and very epic. Um, and this was selected for the 2000 Whitney Biennial. If any of you guys are big fans of contemporary art or American art, 
the Whitney Biennial is a very, very big distinction. Um, it's almost like getting a Grammys for contemporary art. Right. So I'm going to show you uh, Grammatron. That might be the wrong link. Um, it is the wrong link. Just one second. I got to grab it. Oh, did someone put it in the chat? Oh, how convenient. Someone put it in the chat. Thank you, Michael. Um, so this artwork, just like the last two, starts with a, a cover screen. Um, not all of these links were added when this uh, first iteration of Grammatron was first published. Uh, there's just more information that Mark America adds to um, this cover screen as you know more he makes more more things um, to go along with it. Uh, so I'm going to click on begin to start the story. And I'm actually going to go through the lower bandwidth version called Abe Golem, uh, because this was the version that was made first, just trying to go in chronological order and, and show you a lot of the earliest examples. Right. <clears throat> I'll just read what we see on screen first. Abe Golem, legendary info sh shaman, cracker of the sorcerer code and creator of Brahmatron and Nanoscript. Sat behind his computer, every speck of creative ore long since excavated from his burnt out brain, wondering how he was going to survive in the electrosphere he had once called home. He, his glazed donut eyes were spacing out into the vast electric desert, looking for more words to transcribe his personal loss of meaning. I am Abe Golem, an old man. I drove a sign to the end of the road and then I got lost, find me. So that sets the stage, sets, the, uh, sets up the book for a very interesting story. Um, it's about this man, Abe Golem, who is, he has this dilemma. He's, he's a writer, a novelist, and he's uh, presented with this new world that has come from all this new technology, the uh, electrosphere. You can kind of think of it as like the metaverse, metaverse before we had a term for it. Um, and he's wondering, like, what do I do with writing in this new world? How, if I am all about writing and this new world, um, how will it change me? How can I find myself? Um, but again, this starts the story. But as you can see, there's a lot of links in this short paragraph. Um, so a lot like my boyfriend came back from the war and um, Jody. Uh, the experience and the story depends on the user. It depends on what we choose to click on and in which, which order. Um, so everyone can have a different experience um, and you can have multiple experiences depending on what you choose to click on. Um, so I, I won't go through too much because again, this is an, an epic novel and there are 400 uh, pages. Um, uh, but it uh, it essentially has that feeling of a a um, what is it called a create your own story book uh, the kind of books that have like they give you a prompt and then they say like oh do you want to do this next or do you want to do that next and you can choose which path you go on um, but those create your own stories books they still kind of have an ending maybe there's multiple endings but this one um, I'm not sure I don't think there there isn't an ending, it's interlinked. The hypertext li literature is interlinked. So you kind of just keep exploring more of the environment that Mark America has uh, written about in this novel. Um, you, you can think of it like if you play um, video games and you are entering a, a new world, a massive multiplayer online role-playing game, yeah, you have to just you have to explore the world and discover more of the world to get the story. Kind of like Pokemon. Um, but not really like Pokemon. Right. Um, and again, this this uh, novel is epic and the project itself is epic. He's he's iterated on this 
Grammatron a few different times, uh, and he's still working on it in different ways and different capacities. All right. Um, so again, never ending. What is kind of what is kind of scary is the possibility of never reaching production closure because of the advent of all of these software applications. Definitely. Um, ooh, someone said something about AI. You guys definitely know where I'm going with this. Okay. <laughs> all right. So those three artworks I showed you, all around or a little bit before when the New York Times got online. So they beat the Times, is what I'm saying. Um, and it's right around the time when the Yankees won the World Series. Um, in this a uh, screenshot of early New York Times on the web, getting the latest version of software through the web, advertising software on newspapers, really old newspapers. Um, and then by 1997, the original net artists are starting to, or starting to so solidify their de the definition of net art, internet art with a capital N here. Um, so this graphic was created by uh, another arts duo, MTAA, uh, and they created this graphic uh, and shared it with that mailing list uh, that Olia Lialina was running to kind of get all these artists talking about what they're doing. Um, and everyone on the mailing list agreed that this is a pretty good graphic of what's going on. So it's not just about the computers and what you make on a computer. It's about the computers being connected and the humans um, being connected and communicating through the internet. Right. And in the late nineties, I'm finally here to just put that in perspective. Um, I think it's it's uh, it, it helps for me to put things in perspective with my own life. Um, I don't know if you guys want to. It's better for you to understand things through your own life if you were involved with these technologies when they were coming out. Um, or you can use my life, my life to help. <laughs> All right, actually, I said I was going to answer some questions about um, some of the artwork. Let me see. I think it was largely uh, some chatter. I'm not sure if I saw any questions, specific questions. Oh, Todd says he used a Mac one. I'm guessing that's before the Mac II. I wonder how large that computer was. In the 90s, one megabyte was considered huge. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, when floppy disks were like 1.3 megabytes. <laughs> when are you a millennial? <laughs> I am... Um, let's see, does millennials start, I was born in 1995. I think millennials either started 1990, like four or six. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the, I'm in the middle. W what generation are you, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a, a, a good chunk of, uh, Gen X folks in here because uh, I, I'm Gen X, um, and I, hearing people kind of reminiscing about um, mid '90s made me think um, that there's uh, some Gen X representation in here. I really wish I was born like like five years earlier. I listened to so much um, like golden age hip hop and like early mm -hmm. '90s music. I would have loved to see more of those people live. Yeah. All right. Um, next part, the awesome part, the WordPress part. Um, so yeah, all of those three artworks that I um, uh, showed as examples, that was way before WordPress came on the scene. So these people were um, working without a content management software and they were just, you know, hard coding things in HTML and whatever else was available before WordPress and other CMSs. Um, so this is starting to kind of go along with the history of uh, web, web 1, Web 2, and Web 3, if you guys are familiar with those terms. Um, but uh, 
in in um, a very short amount of time, the number of websites increased drastically. But not only the number of websites, but the amounts, uh, but the types of websites. So websites that allow for users to publish their own content. Um, so platforms. WordPress is one of the uh, largest um, softwares that help people publish things online. Uh, and it's different from social media where you obviously, you know, you have your own social media page, but WordPress helps you create a website and put a website directly on the internet. Um, so WordPress uh, was invented in 2003 and it's an open source content management system, which means uh, it handles the theme and your plugins. It handles the media and the database uh, and the core, um, everything that could, that makes up your website. And it comes between um, you as the website builder and the, the raw code that is your website that the browser is reading. Um, so of course, WordPress helps in a lot of different ways. It helps people make, it makes it easier to build websites, which makes it easier to build companies, either brick and mortar companies or internet companies, both. It makes it easier to publish content of all different types, not just the New York Times, but, um, you know, small photographers on Instagram um, or, you know, your own WordPress site, of course. And it makes it easier to connect to people. Uh, so, like I said, it's it's this follows the history of Web One, Two, Three. So the original net artists with the capital N were working mostly in Web One before uh, WordPress came on the scene. Uh, web Two is really um, about the platforms and about user generated content. So in this graphic, you can see from Web One that arrow pointing up for user generated content is very skinny but in web two, it gets fatter. Um, and then web three is not only about user-generated content, but about just scale. Uh, the fact that there's so many people online, the fact that most, uh, most business and most life just happens online, um, the internet by web three is ubiquitous. Um, web three, and th these have a lot more uh, involved definitions that I, I can't get into all the definitions right now. There's a lot about you know, politics um, and economics as well, but I'm kind of just focusing on like the scale, uh, the access of people to the internet and its effect on culture. So because so many more people are online and experiencing the internet in every part of their life every day, um, the internet culture is understood by a lot more people. Um, so, uh, in addition to WordPress, some of the other big factors that bring us from then till now are smartphones and PCs. So we have a lot more devices that are connected to the internet. I think I have four. I have four screens in my room at the moment, and I don't know. I think I have probably eight internet-connected devices in my apartment total. <laughs> Um, and then social media is a big one too. Um, web, WordPress is awesome because you can put content on a website, but sometimes content makes more sense on a different platform like Facebook uh, or TikTok. Um, and then of course, blockchain is a huge one. Um, I've always, I've kept an eye on uh, NFTs and, and um, Bitcoin and Ethereum just because I'm very curious about that space, about the, the economics of it really. Uh, and WordPress only get, has only gotten bigger and bigger. Um, I think, uh, so 43%, this graphic says 43%. I think I took this graphic from State of the Word last year. Um, it hovers around 43% uh, market capitalization for WordPress compared to other, other methods of building websites and other content management softwares like Shopify or, or Drupal. Um, so that's insane. That is a lot. That's a lot of websites. That's a lot of market capitalization. That's a lot of people 
who know how to use WordPress and know how to put things on the internet and create websites, internet art, internet companies, et cetera. Um, so WordPress really revolutionized the web um, because it's open source and the community is very open and friendly, uh, volunteer driven. Uh, WordPress as a whole, I'd say is very transparent. Uh, anyone can contribute and see what's going on, where their ticket is. Uh, it's also democratized. WordPress is the best of democracy in action. Yes, I agree, Dan. Um, it's, it's democratized. Um, you can play a part if you want. The people at the, at the top listen to everyone else in the community. Uh, definitely relatively speaking, like if you compare WordPress to uh, for-profit internet companies, places like Amazon, Adobe, Microsoft, um, it's, it's a whole different thing. And WordPress provides no code options. I think a couple years ago is when full site, the full site editor was brought into WordPress core. Um, so, you know, you can do everything on the front end um, without code. Um, before then there were page builders and other plugins and add-ons you can do to avoid having to code. Um, but from the beginning of WordPress, it's, it's always been to democratize publishing. So you don't necessarily need to be a web developer to be a publisher. Um, and through all this history as WordPress is becoming more and more usable and the internet is becoming more and more popular, um, the in internet art has changed. The internet artists are working differently. And, and the times have changed. And when the times change, historians got to call it something different. Uh, so they've, the original internet art artists started, stopped, they've stopped using the capital I for internet art or the capital N for net art. And they uh, went to using the lowercase I to describe internet art that is kind of no longer part of the original group, um, but still counts as internet art. Um, so this is this is what art historians do. This is what historians do. I th I'd say a good example of this is um, minimalism. Uh, minimalism, it uh, as a fine art movement in the '60s and '70s, I think uh, those artists were they called themselves minimalists. They used a capital M, and uh, they were very consciously uh, going out to create minimalist art. They were talking with each other, saying like, this is minimalism, this isn't minimalism. And they were just very, very conscious of forming a definition. Um, so that's what those internet artists were doing as well. So around mid, uh, maybe 2005 to between uh, 2005 and 2010, um, that's when like the original movement kind of ended and they started using the lowercase i. just to explain how this um, artwork um, terms work. All right, so I'm gonna share uh, just three more examples of uh, new newer examples of lowercase i internet art. And um, like I said, this is just art that um, can be described as internet art. Not Sometimes these, these artists aren't even calling themselves internet artists. Uh, for example, Ani and Susie, I think they just call themselves like conceptual artists, um, uh, but of course, uh, historians would, I think, would still call it internet art. So um, Ani and Susie, they are a, a duo, two of them. So there's, they make um, what I'd call platform art. And I think I saw this term used in some um, press releases as well. Their stuff is hilarious, absolutely hilarious, as I will show you very soon. And um, what's really cool about their work is that they, they've, um, it's, it's, it's their career, but also their art. They've learned to kind of do similar things in a business context with marketing. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna get into Amazon dating, definitely one of my um, favorite sites right now. So this is Amazon Dating, amazondating.co. <clears throat> and uh, 
and it's Amazon. It's the same interface as Amazon, the same setup and everything. But instead of using uh, products as content, they're using people. <laughs> so this is like uh, using the interface of a, an e-commerce platform, but the content of a dating app. So it kind of just makes it seem like dating is very, um, you know, uh, like, you know, you're adding your date to a cart. It, it just <laughs> feels, feels weird. Um, and this is just hilarious too. Like, let's see Cora, 78 years old. Her price is $149. Love language, words of affirmation. She'll make you cookies. Um, I think this project took a little over a year for Ani and Susie to put together. Um, I think it was a little towards the beginning of COVID, maybe right before COVID started. Um, and it was it was very interactive when they got um, all of their friends and family to contribute. So these are real people. You can click on you know a product and uh, read their reviews. Um, so I love this piece. I, I think it's hilarious. It has a lot of marketing value as well, but it also just makes you think of, makes you realize that like dating now, especially with dating apps, it kind of just feels like you're putting a person in a cart and clicking by now. <laughs> um, so the next uh, artist I'll show you, her name's Sean A, Michael Lane Holloway. Um, and I like her stuff because she uses the internet and the medium of the internet to critique power structures um, all around the world, especially um, with respect to identity politics. Um, I would say that viewers' discretion is advised with a lot of her work, but definitely explore um, her stuff more on your own. Um, she critiques, um, again, power structures, a lot of themes about um, uh, racial politics, um, uh, gender identities, and all that. I would also say her stuff is, is a, um, it's, it can be pretty academic. Uh, she, I think she used to teach at the uh, Chicago Insti Art Institute in Chicago. And now I think she's at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. But yeah, she's, she's a professor. Uh, definitely invite you to explore that more on your own time. And this last artist I'll show you, um, I like his stuff because it's it's just playful and they're very short. They're, they're small pieces, kind of the opposite of an epic novel like Grammatron. Um, so um, this is his website, just the websites, sorry, his personal website, just the websites portion of his site because he makes some other things. Um, and yeah, there's dozens and dozens of these things. And um, I can just click on a thing and it turns a color and I can click on another circle and it turns the other color. That's it, that's all that's going on. This is pretty fun. <laughs> I feel like you can use this kind of like a fidget spinner. Um, Raphael is, um, I, I believe he is one of the first people to sell websites as artworks, and he did it without NFTs. Um, he would just sell the domain name to the buyer, and the buyer owns the domain and therefore owns the artwork. Um, so I think we only have 10 minutes left. So I'm just going to go over uh, the last section and one short demo. Uh, so we can, so I can, I guess, answer some more questions. Um, but yeah, uh, what do we do now that we know about the, the original net artists? And what do we do now that we have a tool, an amazing tool like WordPress uh, at our, at our, in our toolkit? Um, but also what about all these new technologies coming like artificial intelligence and blockchain and um, virtual reality? What do we do now? Um, I say we should take inspiration from what the original net artists did. 
Uh, they were entering a new terrain. They were really pioneers. They didn't necessarily know what they were doing when they were doing it, which is why they kept communicating with each other to try and figure things out. But they kind of just fearlessly approached this new medium and just started playing with things until something happened. Um, so I'd say take, take inspiration from them. It looks like a couple of photos didn't load. Um, so for me, trying to figure out what we can do in the future um, and why we should you know, keep looking into internet art and keeping an eye on what internet artists are doing. Um, that's like asking, you know, what, what, is net arts what is net arts function for us today? Um, how does art history and history function for people today? Um, and that's, I mean, I guess it's a really dynamic answer. We look into history to understand the past, to understand what was happening in the past, how people solved problems in the past um, and understand what is here today because uh, not every, everything that's here today came from the past. Um, but also we can look to artists to learn to experiment with what they had available to them in the past and in the present. Um, artists are great innovators. They don't necessarily think about um, what they're making as a product, uh, but rather something that doesn't has, have a business, necessarily a business application or intended for a business application, just intended to express themselves um, and uh, be put out in the world for some sort of appreciation. Um, and sorry about these photos. The photos that, I, that were here, I had a photo of when I was an intern at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 2016, and then a photo in front of the same painting at the same museum last year. Uh, just to show that, um, you know, my my um, my perspective is is really what's helped me understand what the net artists are doing and appreciate what they're doing. I I went from being kind of this art history, this contemporary art person, to being a digital product designer in in a short span of time, and I see a lot of similarities between art and and products. Um, they're made of the same things. They're made by people with the same skills. They just have a different intention. Again, um, products have that business, um, more of a business focus, um, whereas art is for um, more expression and appreciation. So um, this quote from Alia Leolina, I, I think, um, explains or supports a lot of what I just said. So only when users start to express themselves with these technical innovations, do they truly become relevant to culture at large. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, you know, the world around us is built with technology. Technology is a medium that we can use for art, but also the internet is such a, a ubiquitous technology right now. It's so um, it's power, so powerful and it's everywhere in our life, it's ubiquitous. So we should try and use this medium to express ourselves, um, understand culture, participate in culture so we're not left behind with the Gen Zs and all that. Um, all right, so in this last five minutes, I think I'll have enough time to go through um, just one last uh, demo. So um, I'm still really fascinated with Mark America's work, Grammatron, and again, just how epic it, it is and how it's ongoing, how he remixes and iterates on the same idea and the same story when new technology um, is available. So I tried to do the same thing. I, I I work with WordPress and I, I work with Elementor. So I recreated Grammatron using those tools and it was very easy because I didn't have to code. Um, actually, I, I didn't even need to use Elementor. I probably could have just used the full site editor. 
Um, but the content, the, the story inside is generated by ChatGPT. Um, so I'm not a novelist. Um, I guess the stories I tell tend to be presentations. Uh, so I, I don't write books. I'm not a novelist in that way. So I use ChatGPT to help me write the story. Um, and it, it definitely helped a bit. It definitely um, made it faster for me to write things, but it, the story got very boring very fast. Um, so I'll just read what um, the opening sentence. Abe Golem is a writer living in the metaverse where he spends his days exploring the endless possibilities of digital worlds. For Abe, the metaverse is a playground where anything and everything is possible, and he often finds himself lost in its endless possibilities. Um, so that was what ChatGPT gave to me when I asked, um, when I said, uh, start a story or write the beginning of a story about a guy, Abe Golem, who is a writer and he's in this metaverse type of place with endless possibilities and he um he has a dilemma both like too many opportunities but also too many problems coming with this new world um i thought maybe this first sentence was all right not as good as mark mark america's but it's all right and i linked different words to different pages and filled that content with um, something about the word. So I asked ChatGPT to say something about, um, more about something else. So let me just go back one page. So I clicked on the word, the word possibilities, endless possibilities, and I asked ChatGPT, explain more about the possibilities. And this is what ChatGPT said about the possibilities, anything and everything. In the metaverse, Abe Golem can be anyone he wants to be and do anything he wants to do. He can explore different worlds, meet new people, and have adventures that are only limited by his imagination. The metaverse is a place where anything and everything is possible. And Abe Golem is a writer who knows how to take advantage of that. Uh, so it's not too bad, but it's starting to repeat itself. Um, yeah, this last sentence is just, that was kind of a duplicate of the previous page. And uh, the story just gets, gets kind of boring after that. Um, running, I'm running out of time, but uh, I will be sharing uh, my webpage presentation so that you guys have all these links to go through on your own a little more. Um, but yeah, I, what I learned from this experiment uh, with trying to replace the content with AI was that um, it didn't work, at least not for me. And I think it's because, again, I'm not a novelist. I don't really know how to write novels, let alone how to write hypertext literature. So um, adding artificial intelligence, it, it made me, I guess, spit text out faster, but it's not like the text was good. I didn't really know how to tell the chat GPT to write better content. Um, so I think what I'm trying to say, well, really what Mark America says, I think is a great way to explain it. Um, my focus is and has always been to look at the role that techne or techni technicity plays to really investigate the prosthesis I am. Um, so what he's saying here is um, with the internet and technologies that came after after the internet is he uses this as a prosthesis for his own creativity, for his own ideas. Um, you know, a prosthetic is if you think of like an arm or a leg, it can replace something that someone has lost or it can replace um, or it can uh, augment your own body and, and add more capabilities. Um, but it, it works with what you're already working with. So if, if Mark America is already this, you know, experienced novelist, lots of books written, lots of hypertext written, AI can only like supercharge his creativity. Um, I'm sure I can find better uses for AI for myself, you know, maybe writing blog posts, 
or uh, social media posts because uh, that's what I do. I'm not a novelist. <laughs> um, so I hope from this presentation, you um, will, be, will be fearless and go forth and making art with WordPress and all of the new tools that you have available to you and all the new stuff that will come in the future because um, of all those endless possibilities. So thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I'll be sharing this web page. Um, let's see, did the, I'll be sharing it very soon. <laughs> yeah, we'll share it in the, um, in the meetup event. Um, I will often send like a follow-up email to, to thank folks for coming and share all the links that are relevant to the presentation. So um, yeah, that'll be coming up and then the recording will be posted within the next 24 hours as well. Okay, great. I know we're two, two minutes over. Um, do I still have time to answer questions? If folks want to stay on and have any questions, um, you're, you're welcome to, to stay on. Um, but yeah, no problem. Um, any questions out there? I think um, you might have the, here, I think we have the mute um, capability um, off. So if folks wanna speak out and have any questions um, or comments, feel free to unmute. In the meantime, um, I'm just going to go ahead and share uh, a link again to learn WordPress. Um, you'll find links to more um, online workshops there. We also have like uh, tutorials and courses and lesson plans, all educational material for um, for learning word learning and teaching WordPress. So, um, yeah, I think. Uh... I think my site generated awesome. well. Um, <laughs> my, my personal website is um, static. And the first time I generated the this web page, it didn't have all the photos. I wonder uh, if those other photos showed up. There are yeah, the photos. There it is. <laughs> yeah. There you are. And I will put this in the chat. Great. If folks want to save the chat, that's also uh, enabled. So if you click on, I think on the three dots at the bottom of the chat window, you can save the entirety of the chat as a text file. So you'll have all the links available. All right, well, thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, looks like we don't have any questions coming in. Um, yeah, just a lot of comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a lot of comments throughout the um, throughout your presentation. Um, but yeah, thank you, Lynn, for for joining us and and sharing everything about internet art. Um, I know there's a, a lot more that that we could do um, as as artists and WordPress users. So. Um, yeah, this is really inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for inviting me. I love, of as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, folks. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and um, we'll see you next time. Right. See you. Bye.